So here, we have found Tim. He is going to talk to us today about what happens when BGP meets big data. Perfect. All right, so this presentation was gonna be originally given by Joel Opsfeld, but he couldn't make it. So I'm gonna do it uh, for him. Um, I've been doing BGP collection and analysis for the past couple years. Uh, been specifically working on the OpenBMP project and working with analytics of internet routing, we work with CADA, we work with RIPE, we, uh, we work with RouteViews and uh, a bunch of other people to uh, profile and collect internet data, but also uh, the internal data. So data centers, uh, IGP monitoring, so link state, ISIS and OSPF monitoring. And what we see with this is that internal monitoring, data center monitoring is really not that big. It, it's actually quite small. It seems large to some people. But when we actually analyze the data, it's, uh, it's less than 100 million objects. So it's really nothing that we need to worry about. And we can scale that on a single instance. So a single node is not really a problem to handle that data. But when we look at the internet data, specifically IPv4 data, in the case of route views data, um, we see that it's a dramatic difference. So here are some numbers where we have 15 of route views routers being monitored. Of the 15, we have uh, 410 peers. If we were to sum up all of the prefixes across all of those peers, so that would be v4 and v6, uh, we would have 120 million prefixes that are active, that are being monitored with just that uh, set of routers. If we look at just a single IPv4 peer and look at how many changes happened in a given 24 hours of time, we would see over 950,000 for a v4 peer. So it's a little less than a million uh, changes that we see for one V4 uh, peer. This is on all of the V4 peers. And not all peers are equal, so we do have some peers that have less prefixes. We have uh, V6 is significantly less. As mentioned earlier, it's only 40,000. Um, but if we take our data set that we have from route views, we see 202 million prefixes in 24 hours uh, of data. So as we can see, if we multiply that out for 30 days, uh, just for one month of retention for all of the change log information, it's over six billion objects that we're maintaining. So it's a significant set when we look at the over time amount of this data. So trying to extract that data uh, through this system using uh, indexes or traditional methods uh, has proven not to really scale that well. So even like if you use some of the time series databases like InfluxDB or Elasticsearch or um, uh, you know, we wouldn't use OpenTSDB because it doesn't support uh, strings, but regardless, if you try to use those systems, they all don't scale unless you actually start clustering. So you have to cluster the data in order to, to use it. So we start to get into the, what we would consider big data at that point because we need big data type of systems. We need clustering. Small data or, or normal data, uh, I would say is like a single instance. So if you can get away with it with a single instance, uh, with a single vertical scale, then, then that's like no big deal. But when we get into the realm of I need at least 10 servers to be able to handle uh, six months worth of data and analytics of that data, it definitely is more of a d big data problem. So with this, we, we definitely, with BGP data, we have a situation when we want to do analytics, we want to look at all of the data. Um, Sometimes we want to look at time specific when somebody reports a problem and says there was a route leak and we want to go back and look at that specific time. But usually when we're doing analysis, like aggregate analysis, we want to actually look at uh, everything that's active and the aggregate may have been 17 days old active, meaning that it was last updated 17 days ago, yet we have change that's happening right now. So we have to look back in time and we have to see all of that data, which means we need to do large queries, large uh, analysis of this data, which makes it a little unrealistic when it's so large. Um, one example of the uh, uh, aggregate analysis that we, we can do uh, now that we have better data uh, collection is we can um, look holistically. So we can look at all of the routers and we can look at all of the peers rather than a single 
focus, like one router and looking at can you suppress a more specific, we actually look at all routers. And we can look at the paths for the more specific and we can see if that more uh, specific is being used or is needed anywhere else uh, in the collection. And if it is needed, then we wouldn't recommend suppressing it. But if it's, if it's identical to the aggregate and everybody has the aggregate, then we would recommend a suppression of that. So with the data monitoring, we don't just want to monitor one peer. So most people, when they look at BGP monitoring, they look at just one uh, BGP peer that they're monitoring, like getting an eBGP feed. But that eBGP feed is technically only what would be considered like adjacency rib n if you're monitoring the received prefixes that you're seeing from that BGP feed. We actually want to monitor more places than that. We want to uh, monitor five distinct uh, locations. And we have adjacency rib n, which is what's received. We have uh, post policy, which is what has uh, been received but has gone through policy. So any filters, any modifications to the attributes, uh, community strings, AS path, whatever, that's post policy. If you were to do a diff between post policy, you should be able to actually validate your, your ingress uh, policy because it should be an identical representation of the net effect of what your ingress policy is doing on that given peer. We also have adjacency rib out, post policy and pre-policy, which is very similar, except for it's the outbound advertisements. And then we have the fifth one, which is the local rib. The local rib is um, specifically defined um, as being the selected, used, installed local rib. It's different than the adjacency rib out, which some people get confused. They think adjacency rib out is equivalent. And it's not, because adjacency rib out, you can have ad paths or no ad paths. Uh, you can have different policies, and you may still actually be sending prefixes out, but you're not actually using those prefixes in the local rib. And with the local rib, we do want to um, see what the router is, use, is, is actually using. Uh, and if it's not using it, we want to know about that. One of the big uh, things for local rib is also we don't want to require peering. So we shouldn't need to receive prefixes or advertise prefixes in order to do BGP collection because BGP is obviously collecting more than just traditional IPv4 and v6. We also have link state uh, collections, so we definitely want to get link state, which is locally originated, out of the router via some protocol like BMP um, without having to uh, require peering. So the RFC right now, 7854, does uh, document and define the JCC ribbon pre and post policy as well as a uh, tidbit on locally originated. Um, we have two new drafts that are, uh, have been accepted by the IETF, so we'll have a name change. Um, the local rib actually updates 7854 by clarifying the local origination, and the adjacency rib out adds the adjacency rib out monitoring. Um, I will quickly mention the reason why some people want to do adjacency rib out, especially any service provider who, who wants to monitor what they're sending to a customer. Uh, we, we were contacted by some folks who said, hey, can you monitor, can we get the information from route views or can we get the information from other public sources and can you tell us if we leak something? And it's like, well, you should be able to see that yourself. And the problem is they can't see what they're advertising, so they have to look to somebody else to tell them what they're advertising. Uh, with the JCC rib out, you get that use case um, uh, covered. So, uh, some of the people in here might have used OpenBMP. Um, we're going through a name change, so we're part of Linux Foundation now, and we're changing the name to Streaming Network Analytics System, uh, primarily because we want to widen the scope. We want to include more than just BGP BMP data. We want to do all routing data. Uh, so we felt the name OpenBMP was too specific. So there's still a uh, process of changing names. So GitHub still has OpenBMP, but you'll see over the next few months, things will migrate over to SNAS. Um, right now, this is the architecture that we have. We have basically a collector, and the collector uh, takes the data, parses the data, sends it to a uh, Kafka bus, which um, normalizes the data and it maintains the original copy as well. Um, we want to have a produce once consumed by many model because we don't want to have the problem with like SNMP or any other management system where every management system starts to collect and uh, access the same exact data. So we don't want to have 15,000 peers just for monitoring. We would like to have one selection, one place where you get the data collection and then feed that out to anybody who wants to consume it. Um, so we have a series of consumers. One of them is the database that we have, which is MariaDB. And that database um, I would consider is more small data 
um, it, it is intended by itself to handle roughly 60 million prefixes. So you can maintain 60 million, usually without a problem, uh, and you can maintain several months of data. Uh, usually we, we do like three months of data, and that's not really a big deal. Anything that goes beyond that, it starts to get too large. Uh, we get I.O. bound, and there's nothing we can really do about I.O. bound issues. Um, specifically, uh, we can try to do some craziness with the disks and try to offload partitioning with disks, but that gets uh, too server specific and it won't work in a virtual environment anymore if we require that. And we just don't even want to uh, enter into that phase. So we typically say that the database is um, really good for internal monitoring, data center monitoring. Uh, you can do like a pop location, you know, with, with several routers in one location, but you will have to um, uh, spin up multiple instances in order to monitor a larger set. And the problem we have with that is how do I do analytics across that, all of those uh, instances? And that's what we don't really solve with this particular database, and that's where um, we need a platform um, to solve that. Uh, such as the uh, platform for network data analytics uh, to do that. So if you did want to use the database, you can go natively to the database. You can get, um, you can pretty much run any analytical query you want. You can use R, you can use IPython, Jupyter, uh, you can use TIBCO, Jasper Studios, um, or R Studios or whatever. You can use anything to interact with this data and it works very fast, um, usually within a second if you use indexes. You can change those indexes. You can uh, add triggers, remove triggers, uh, uh, which allows you to, to manipulate data on the fly. Um, you can also set up events. So you have a full gamut of capability, but again, it's still a small box. It's still just 60 million prefixes. Um, you can interact with the API and the UI. If anybody's ever looked at the OpenBMP UI, this is where we're actually accessing that data. It goes uh, through a web services, uh, API to the MySQL MariaDB instance. Now, if you want to replace the database, and in the case of what we're gonna do here for big data is we, we want to uh, drop and replace this particular database with, with an alternate database, or an alternate storage system um, that can scale to a much bigger size. So where we would do that is obviously not trying to go through the database that's there. We would obviously do that directly to Kafka. And anybody who wants to do analytics, like if you're doing a watching or eventing or anything like that, you can go directly to Kafka and uh, monitor that data real time. Um, but if you need to store that data and you want to archive it uh, long term, you need some type of storage. So what we did is uh, Panda.io is a Linux Foundation um, platform for network data analytics, and it takes in multiple sources. It's not just BGP data, it's not just telemetry data, it's not just NetFlow, it's all of them. It takes all of the data in and leverages existing platform capabilities uh, or existing big data tac uh, techniques as well as um, components. Um, and it puts it in a nice package so that you can scale this with a cluster, so you, you theoretically don't have to worry about the scale. So we wanted to test this out, and we really wanted to make sure this whole thing would work the same way that our Mar um, MariaDB instance is working, but we wanted to make sure it would work with, with this large uh, Hadoop-backed base uh, system. So we tap in um, uh, with the Kafka feed, and we translate that data to Avro, and we put that into, it goes, actually goes back into Kafka, but then feeds into, um, into the platform. Once we get into the platform, we can do the very uh, similar things that we're doing with, with the MariaDB uh, instance where we have a uh, web services and a web UI that allows you to visualize the data. So the big thing that this is gonna give us is it's going to give us the, the ability that we can scale uh, this system without having that, that, that box of saying 60 million prefixes. And, and kind of to give an idea of the 60 million prefixes is a large route reflector for, for most tier one providers um, typically would have around 50 million prefixes already on that route reflector. Uh, a peering router typically would have 25 to 30 million for just one peering router, like one of the route views routers, like one of the large ones. Um, as you can see, 60 million is only just a couple routers uh, in that particular environment, which is why we want to use uh, this backed system that has a better, larger scale backend system. So kind of going through the testing to make sure that this would work in the exact same way. If anybody, again, has, is used to our current UI, uh, we, have a, um, we have various views that you can navigate through the data. So we're kind of going through roughly the same thing, but this is all facilitated 
through the Panda platform instead. So we're not using the MariaDB at all. And what we're able to get through this is we're able to get, um, just like we did before, we can actually count all distinct prefixes. We can do an AS path analysis and we can index every AS um, that we see. And we can count every transit. We can count um, uh, by ASN, we can count every transit and also we can count every origination um, prefix that's being originated by that. And of course you can search it. And we can do the same thing if you wanna drill into the AS. This is very similar to our AS view uh, page. You can drill into the AS and you can see what prefixes for a given time period were uh, changed or, or have this AS in the path. So this would be like looking at the AS path and doing a filter by saying uh, 15412 and saying what actually is in uh, or what prefixes are, are seen with that AS path. And you can see this with very quick analytics um, uh, through the system. As with most, uh, uh, Viewing representations, we can view this in different ways. So this is a different AS analysis, which is commonly done where we would pretty much flatten out all the ASs and then associate them to any given AS. So as we look through uh, all of the AS paths for a given AS, so if we filter it again to 15412, uh, and we look at all of the ASs and put them into a unique list, we can then represent that unique list um, in any visualization that we wanna see. And in this particular case, we represent it with these uh, bubble chart, and what we're doing as well as overlaying that with the impact of the other ASs with their transit and origination. So we can put overlays to this data. Uh, as you'd expect, if you look at a different AS, it's gonna be a different uh, visualization, um, and will most likely be large. In some cases, as in anybody who uses BTB Play or anything else like that, you, you end up getting such a mess that you can't actually even look at it. Um, one of the big things with analytics is going back in time and looking at the history. So we can see here in this particular uh, example, we can see that there's convergence. We do see convergence with BMP uh, because we're not snapshot based, we're real time based. And even when we feed in snapshot data, so MRT data can be fed into BMP, um, it still has all the timestamps. So even though it's snapshot, we still have uh, the um, iterative timestamps that are, that are within the messages. So we can still see different convergence and we can still see the ripple effects. So we can expand this to look at all of the peers and we can see the convergence of where something starts and then you know, when it completes. Um, so we can look at that. And this example here shows that it obviously um, within HE, with, this is one of the HE peers, um, Clearly, they have, a, they have multiple connections uh, uh, to CocoNet, and from that, um, we're, we, for whatever reason, we saw the uh, prepended path, the longer prepended path uh, quicker or earlier than we saw the shorter one, and it just normalized on the shorter one. Uh, everybody loves BGP play. Everybody loves to go back to that thing and look at it. I, I tend to think it looks very messy at some, uh, some cases, but we want to do the same thing, of course. Uh, so we can uh, do the same thing with the Panda data as well. We can go back and replay the data from any given source to any given destination ASN. So rather than just focusing on a single AS and saying what's the history look like with this AS or what's the history look like with this AS with a bunch of other ASs, we can actually go back and analyze AS to AS and say what has been changed between those uh, ASs. So we can visualize all possible paths um, from an AS perspective. What's not shown here is we actually can visualize this with an overlay that uh, includes uh, link state as well. So with link state, we can, over, um, we can actually add the next hops and we can put the uh, IGP overlay into this and you can actually see the routers and where the peering actually is. We can look at this from a uh, same, same data but look at this from a different perspective and look at it from a uh, list view. So we can see more of a, a table slash list view of the same path history and, and possible paths. So one of the big things that we wanna do with uh, the analytics is, is typically be able to search relative to a prefix and find other prefixes that are related. And it's something that we do all the time with the MariaDB instance, we wanna make sure we can do that also with a Hadoop or, or a much larger big data analytic platform. And this is an example of looking at a more specific. So we see the more specific and we can easily detect within this platform, uh, we can also pull up the uh, aggregate. And in this case here, it's the default route. Uh, but in no, most cases, it would be a, uh, an aggregate that would, um, that this prefix would, would um, be tied to. And we can look at the chain of aggregates as well. So we can look at the whole chain going back. 
So if anybody's, again, looked at the OpenBMP UI, you will see that we have a security analysis. And if you've ever used that, it has a correlation and tie-in with IRR data as well as uh, RPKI data. Uh, we want to make sure we maintain that same capability and also tie in other data, including, uh, in this case here, Bogon uh, addresses. So we can look at the ranges of prefixes and we can tie that to received prefixes that we, we learn and we can categorize them. So we can categorize them obviously as private addresses but also as unallocated addresses. And that can change over time, so depending if those uh, get removed from the list, uh, we can remove that and update that category over time. So we can do that level of analytics with this. We can take any associated, uh, associated data, uh, which includes like even telemetry data or, or anything else that you feed into the system. So we definitely want to be able to do a prefix drill down. This is showing the category uh, to, to the right-hand side, but we can do uh, prefix drill down on any prefixes over time, and we can see, you can search by prefix, we can search by ASN, uh, we can search by any prefix and uh, see that over time with this data set. And again, this is pulling the data out of the system, the big data platform, and pulling it out and making it available via APIs and making it available via uh, the web interface. So more specific monitoring is an interesting uh, uh, type of situation because more specific monitoring produces a lot of noise. Um, I'm not sure how many people in here have actually tried to do more specific monitoring, but you have to look up the aggregate. But it's not just looking up the aggregate, you need to look up all of the aggregates, and in some cases you need to actually go look at the more specifics beyond this more specific. Usually, most logic for detecting like a route leak would try to look at uh, some common points, such as RPKI data, find out if this prefix uh, is valid per RPKI. Uh, look at the aggregate and determine if the uh, origins match or not match, and if they don't, um, you would typically accept it. You would also look at similar AS pass or similar transit uh, for the same, uh, for the aggregate as well as more specific and see if they're the same. And you can look at the uh, registry information um, to determine if the ASNs are owned by the same organization. But what we find is that this actually doesn't really work too well anyways because RPKI doesn't have all the prefixes there. Um, the, and, and even some of the RPKI data is actually not correct. So that just makes it even harder. Uh, there are many ASs out there right now that are multi-origin. So we're seeing this uh, in the range of 10,000 per day, we see multiple uh, multi-origin ASs. And typically it's because of multi-country. Um, we also see, uh, just because you peer with level three as an example, doesn't mean that we want to accept a, a more specific from another ASN that happens to peer to level three either. So we can't really re rely on that. And the who is information is really a challenge because Aaron versus Ripe, the data is not the same. Um, DigitalOcean as an example, which does a lot of more multi-origin advertisements right now. And we see it in Europe and we see it, or via Ripe, and we see it via uh, their uh, Aaron ASNs as well. And it's the same exact prefix. And the problem is that the name is slightly different. So we can't just do a simple match on the name, we have to actually do a loose or a fuzzy match on the name, which means it's somewhat air-prone. Um, and, and that ends up becoming a problem and kind of stresses the fact that we have to do a deeper analytics of this. So um, what we want to do is uh, go deeper into this and look at things. And one of the things is if we only look at the next best aggregate, so in this case here, the slash 18, if that's all we looked at and we only analyze the check space off of that, then somebody who is legitimately trying to hack something, all they gotta do is advertise two prefixes and they can advertise a 23 and a 24. And the 24 might get red flagged, we might freak out about that one, but the, um, the 24 will slip through. So the 23 is used as, you know, get rid of that one, but the intended target was the 24, so we would still inadvertently allow that. So we have to look at the time base, we have to look at all of the aggregates and determine what's really new and um, if it really matches and if it makes sense to actually uh, treat this, this more specific as valid or not valid. So the potential that we get with this type of data is that we can write more micro style analytics. So using that example about origins not matching as an example, um, we can go back and look at, uh, we can have an, an analytics app that all it does is analyze origins and analyze uh, names and, and Ripe and Aaron and Apicnic and, every, and all of the other registries and determine what is actually really the same or, or has some type of common connection point between them. 
And then with that, we can associate that to the prefix data. So if we see a new, more specific, we can quickly look up using the analytics from the other app, we can look up and determine that uh, they're actually part of the same organization, even if the org names don't match, or, or even if uh, they may not at surface level look like they're the same based off of a deeper analytics or analysis, we, we know that it actually is. So Panda.io uh, is, is uh, part of the Linux Foundation, and what it really gives us is, is, is making this much bigger in the sense that we can include more data into this. So we really want to include telemetry data, um, we want to include NetFlow data, we want to include uh, other data sources coming in, and we want to be able to correlate that data across the board, and we want to write the same analytic type application that works with all of that data, not just an open BMP application or not just a, uh, an application that only works for one system. We want to do it so that it takes in um, universal data from all of them and correlate it. So Panda uh, is what actually gives us that capability. So we actually can now take in multiple data feeds. And from multiple data feeds, we can normalize that data and write an application that works across these data feeds. And we can start writing smaller applications that have a very specific purpose, like the origin association or ASN association. We can write that application that feeds back into the system that allows other applications to take advantage of it. So it becomes more of an ecosystem to which can also extend to, to the other data sources. So like telemetry can be correlated with link IDs um, to BGPLS. So you have link IDs that are advertised and or interface IP addresses, and you can correlate that data with, uh, uh, with telemetry. But in order to correlate it, you need to have common fields, common names, common environments. So we need a common platform for that. And Panda provides us that. And it provides us this platform at uh, scale. So it does all the clustering for us so that we don't have to actually reinvent the wheel and we don't have to um, um, try to come up with a new system to do a new type of clustering for BGP data. We can just leverage the existing one. So we're really trying to look towards that. So this is uh, where we from the SNAS OpenBMP side, from, from BGP data, and from how, having to handle large data sets of BGP like internet routing, and we know it's gonna only get worse uh, with, with IPv6 uh, as it actually gets more used and, and widely deployed, uh, that we wanna basically um, leverage this platform that can scale to that level so that we're not fighting this later down the line as soon as we start rolling this stuff out. Uh, you can look at this really busy slide and, and look at all the different components. Uh, Joel Opsfeld uh, recently submitted a YouTube video that goes over specifically the Panda architecture. So you can go to YouTube as well and you can see, if you do a search for panda.io BGP, you can also see that video and um, talks a little bit more about specifically the, the architecture of it and some of the components. Um, the, the nice thing about both of these projects is that they're open source, so we can change them, we can adapt this environment, and anybody can contribute. There, there's really no reason why everybody else in this room can't actually contribute and, and add stuff to it. Um, and that goes for Panda, but that also goes for uh, SNAS.io as well. So that's pretty much the, the presentation. Any, any questions? Okay. One minute to go. <laughs> <laughs>